fantasy short stories. An Interlude of Intrigue, A Tale of Three Kings, by Leslie Heron. Chapter 5, Harmony. Of course, religion on its own is not inherently evil. But the men who wield it as a weapon to persecute others, to justify their greed and prejudices, are the problematic result of religion. They would pervert it, use it as an idea to infect others with the same self-righteous hate and greed. And ideas have a tendency to spread. For two years, the Brotherhood held Still Harbor and its people hostage, erecting a massive stone wall around the city. By the time I infiltrated their gates, the crusade had spread throughout my lands like a plague. As you know, Athia was no longer our ally, and Fusgard had made it clear that they were undecided about where their allegiances fell. They were merely waiting for a better offer, I suppose. And Duharia claimed to support our cause, but did little to prove it. Our borders ran black with the stain of Brotherhood's soldiers. It wasn't until late in the year, during the rainy season, that I managed to free Still Harbor from the religious zealots. Many monks had been slain, but unfortunately, most of them had escaped through the portals into different worlds, I suspect in order to spread their ideals. To make matters worse, I received urgent word to return home. News of my mother's death had spread far enough to reach us. The doctors told me it was a sickness brought on by the cold, but Varen would have you believe the cause of her death was from a broken heart, that she simply never recovered from the loss of my father and withered away. Laughable. I know, because their marriage was an arranged one. Forced unions can't harbor love, can they? Bleak, grey weather settled over the kingdom, with rain as fine as mist blowing on the chill autumn air as if the very heavens wept for the loss of Ebra's queen. Elias stood before a large marble tomb erected in the courtyard of the castle. In the weeks before his return, the monument had been crafted and put out on display for the people, and his mother laid to rest within its walls. Many had voyaged to bring small tokens, gestures of love, to offer the queen and her sons. Her tomb was covered in flowers, rolled letters, and tiny gifts for her to take into her next life. Like the rain, the mourners continued to pour in, walking past and offering solemn condolences to the two men who grieved the passing of their only remaining parent. At the sound of a stifled sob, Elias glanced over to see Varen plucking up a small golden bead that had been left for the queen. He placed a heavy hand on his little brother's shoulder. Are you all right? Varen nodded, wiping his eyes with his sleeve. So many have come. The king moved to accept another traveler's hand, nodding his thanks to the stranger's kind words before turning back to his brother. She touched many lives. She may not have been fay, but she belonged to Ebra. A mother and child offered him a handful of wildflowers, and Varen lost the battle to contain his tears. His body shuddered, but not from the cold or rain. It's not fair. Death had become such a normal part of his life that Elias found himself envious of his sibling's innocence. While he was saddened by his mother's departure, it didn't reach his soul. It never is. He reached out a hand to comfort the prince when he heard footsteps approach. He turned, ready to accept another gift or words of comfort. Instead, he felt his jaw tighten. Brothers, it's so good to see you again. Varen turned, his eyes wide in astonishment. 
Lucian! Surrounded by soldiers from the enshrined wilds, the elf moved to the siblings. While we may not have always seen eye to eye, I am saddened by Octavia's passing. If there is any way I can help... Lucian gave a curt bow. Pulling the man into a tight hug, Baron buried his face into the fur collar of his cloak. You came. That is all you need to do. Elias leveled a glassy stare at his eldest brother. I set you to the Eastern Pass. I assume you have a good reason to abandon your post. <laughs> Isn't being here for Mother's Memorial reason enough? Varen pulled away, shooting the king a dirty look. I asked him to be here today. Be mad at me, not him. So, you two stay in contact then? Elias pulled a face. I thought sending him away would have been enough for you to get the point. He can't be trusted. He always wants something. Varen frowned. Must everything be a conspiracy to you? Could he not be here simply because his siblings are in mourning? Lucian held up a hand. I came to comfort the young prince, yes. But if it pleases his majesty, I also came here at the behest of my mother. An emissary of sorts. Elias rolled his eyes. The Wild Queen has actual emissaries and ambassadors. Why would she send the son she abandoned? Lucian went rigid for a fraction of a moment before a forced smile crossed his lips. Perhaps my mother wanted to remind you of family, since you have so little left. I cannot know her mind. He motioned to his traveling companions, who marched forward and set down two large baskets filled with flowers, berries, jars of honey, and several golden goblets. She sends these gifts in your time of pain. Elias nudged one of the goblets with the toe of his boot. I will be sure to relay our gratitude for her generosity. Might she have also sent troops or armaments, as was agreed to in the spring? Lucian's false smile became genuine. My apologies. The grief has made me forgetful. With a wave of his hand, another man came forward, holding out a scroll for the king to take. Elias snatched it up and began reading. Halfway down the page, he tossed it to the ground, advancing on Lucian. So, once again, you go behind my back to betray me. How convenient her refusal to help coincides with your arrival. The elf stood defiant, pained truth burning in his eyes. I have not spoken to my mother since the day she left. You can look to father if you want someone to blame. A sour churning of hatred filled Elias, and he reached for the hilt of his sword. Varen moved forward, pulling his brothers apart. Please, can you not hold your squabble until after the funeral? Elias leveled a finger on Lucian. He's a disgrace to our ancestors, a snake... Mother would not have stood for him being here. How would you know? The prince placed himself between his siblings. You've been off on one crusade or another since you could ride a horse. You barely knew her. She was my mother too, Varen. How could she be when you were never here? A guttural growl escaped his throat as Elias turned his fury on his little brother. Would you have rather I stayed behind? and let the Brotherhood and all these fear-mongering humans ravage our country. He sucked in a deep breath through his nose, wrestling with his rage. I did what I had to do to keep our people safe, including Mother. Then stop fighting, Theron pointed at the tomb. She solved her issues with words, not steel. He looked mournfully at the hatred in his brother's eyes. A heavy, suffocating silence surrounded them, broken only by the sound of gentle rain and well-wishers milling about. The timely arrival of a massive, ornate carriage gave Elias an excuse to turn away.
but upon seeing the royal crest on its door, his rotten mood soured further. Uharia. There was an eruption of trumpeting fanfare as no less than twelve maidens clambered from the carriage and made their way towards Elias, tucked carefully beneath parasols to combat the drizzle. They wore flowing silks and richly embroidered fabrics in dazzling colors, causing them to stand out among the mourners in garish fashion. Following the last woman, a young man exited the carriage and proceeded to approach as well, wearing a wide smile. Ah, King Elias, it is so good to finally meet you at last. I am Prince Nasir. The man stepped out from beneath his own parasol, bowing low as he extended his hand to show off the large ring that bore the sigil of his home. But when the king did not return the gesture, he simply stood, tucking his hands behind his back, his smile never wavering. Uharia sends its deepest condolences for the passing of Queen Octavia. The twelve maidens strolled forward and showered the tomb in flowers and gold coins. The prince placed a hand over his chest and gave the king a solemn nod. But where one door closes, another opens. As such, I bring glad tidings upon this day of gloom. He opened his hands wide, indicating the many women around him. My father, the Emperor of Uharia, has sent only the finest of his daughters for your choosing. Sure, his teeth would shatter in his mouth from the effort of containing his anger. Elias was grateful that his father had taught him political decorum. He wanted very much so to separate this man's head from his shoulders, but settled for a contemptuous glare. Prince Nasir, thank you for joining us for my mother's funeral, but now is not the time to pick a bride. The prince was unfazed by the king's expression and merely belt out a hearty laugh. <laughs> yes, yes, as I have said, many condolences. There was no empathy in his words. But surely... You must be in search of a wife at last. Without a queen to rule in your stead, you would have to appoint that responsibility to another. And that could be seen as a refusal to uphold our treaty. Will you not honor your father's words? He felt his fingers flex towards the grip of his sword before Elias could regain control of his actions. He took a step forward, the venom in his words carefully laced. It's odd, isn't it, Prince Nasir? The speed at which you pick at my mother's bones compared to your lackadaisical response to send your troops to battle against who you claim is our mutual enemy. Nasir let out a nervous chuckle as he put up his hands with a shake of his head. I did not come here to discuss the politics of my father. I am only here to see that you choose a new wife and cement the future of our two great nations. His fingers had, at last, found purchase around the grip of his sword as Elias took a step back. Of course they only cared about what they would gain and never what they could give. He was ready to draw his weapon when he felt a squeeze on his shoulder. He turned to see a friendly face at last. Surrounded by his wife and several of his daughters, King Lodhir greeted him with a soft smile. He gave him a small nod of understanding and turned to face the young prince. Please, Nasir, you must understand that this is a trying time for all of us, and such decisions cannot be made in haste. Perhaps you could partake in His Majesty's hospitality for a few days to allow the King to mourn and thus approach this with a clear mind when he is ready. The Prince pursed his lips. Of course, we are not monsters after all. We will await your answer in the morning. He turned back to his guards, the flag bearers, the trumpeters, and his twelve sisters, motioning for them to return to the carriage. 
With several cries from sopping and angry horses, the delegates from Uharia disappeared into the gray streets without another word. What a pompous prick! Through the stunned silence, Tiani, Lodhir's wife, wagged a finger at her daughter. Pyra, what have I told you? Lucian raised an eyebrow. Did you just call the future emperor of Uharia a pompous prick? She crossed her arms. Am I wrong? Lodhir nudged his daughter, but hid a smile as he addressed the king. My apologies. We are here to pay our respects. I hope I did not overstep. Elias let out a long sigh, pinching the bridge of his nose. Not at all. Theara knows you probably just saved us from another war. And you managed to buy me time. Only a day. Elias grimaced. I can't stomach the thought of marrying any of them. I don't trust Uharia to rule in my stead while I fight. Then let me. Varen surprised even himself with the suggestion. Make me your regent. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Elias shook his head. Not to be cruel, brother. But how well did that work out last time? I, I know I failed you. Varen gestured behind him with a wave of his hand. But would you rather one of them sit on the throne, or someone who actually cares about Ebra? Elias thrust his chin at Lucian. With him around? I trust the Brotherhood before you while that snake hangs about your neck like a noose. If the Eastern Pass wasn't far enough to keep you two apart, then perhaps the cold of the far north will keep him occupied. You will not send him away again. This is his home, and I will have at least one sibling in my life that cares for me. Theron dropped his hand. He could feel the burn of unwanted attention from strangers and selkies alike. That tickle of rage was back, and Elias returned his brother's boring gaze with one of daggers. Fine, but your gullibility will not be the downfall of this nation again. Consider yourself removed from the line of succession. Varen fell back a step. His mouth hung ajar in shock. Only the council can do that. And so I shall see to it that they do. Lucian slid his fur-lined cloak about the prince. Come, brother. Leave Elias to his madness. With a gentle tug... He steered him away from the memorial towards a secluded archway along the edge of the courtyard. Your letters were a welcome distraction, but we have much to catch up on. Was that the wisest choice? Lothir asked with a hesitant look. Elias deflated. Perhaps not. I love Varen, but Lucian plays him like a puppet. He heaved a sigh. Although, it might not matter for much longer. He stooped, flicking up the scroll from a puddle and offered it to the silky king. The enshrined wilds are pulling their support, and without their help, our kingdom will be quickly overrun. Scanning the sopping letter, Lothir's eyes went wide as he began to read. Why? The Folkgrave line is about to become more human than fey. They fear our allegiances may shift with our blood. Elias gave his brothers another glance. For all I know, they may be right. I'm fighting the tide of opinion, both within the council and even my own family. Lothir looked up from the paper in disbelief. You're certain this correspondence is legitimate? I will have Undine verify when I rejoin her on the battlefield, but it would explain the delay. They've been slowing their support ever since my father died. Elias leaned heavily on his mother's tomb. What am I going to do? There are no good options left. Sure there are. Pyra! Lothir shot his daughter a warning look. You'll have to excuse my daughter's outburst. 
She often speaks her mind, a trait she inherited, I'm sure, from her mother. Elias looked over to see Tiani, scolding the eldest of her daughters. Like her sisters, she had the same dark and dappled skin, but her hair was like her mother's, dark brown that faded to a rich amber color that matched her eyes. There's nothing to forgive, my friend. Perhaps her counsel is as wise as your own. He gave the young woman a smile. What options do you see that I do not? After looking to her father for permission, Pyra returned her gaze to the king, and with a lift of her brow, simply replied, Well, isn't it obvious? Don't marry a human. Impressed by her fearlessness, Elias let out a chuckle. <laughs> as easy as that. With a fiery defiance, Pyra barreled on. Why are you marrying one of those fancy dresses? It can't be for their personality or intelligence. An empty hat has more inside it than those tiaras they wore. Pyra! She ignored her father. No, you're hoping to keep Uharia on your good side so that they will help you fight the Brotherhood, correct? Why would they suddenly start now, just because you gave up half your resources to them? Humans take. That's what they do. Also, you must have missed the shiny gold pin Prince Nasir had on his coat, or you wouldn't even be considering them an ally. It was a book with a feather quill. Elias frowned. He had been so upset by the insult of their arrival that the pin had gone unnoticed. If Uharia's crown prince was wearing the symbol of the Brotherhood, then perhaps his decision had already been made for him. If the humans no longer wish to honor their end of the bargain, then the solution to your problem is to reunite the old god. Marry back into the Fae. Show the enshrined wilds that you are willing to risk it all to stay true to them. Remind them of why they need to support Ebra and they will help you build an army that will remind the humans why they feared us in the first place. Simply remarkable. Elias took a full minute to consider her words. Her speech kindled the fire of a long-forgotten passion. Ebra had once been the impenetrable wall to the east. It could be again. All right. Say you were me. Which fey line would you marry? It wasn't often her words were regarded as anything other than spirited nonsense, and the king's response took Pyra by surprise. Uh, well... She scoured her mind, ticking off the known royal lines as she went. The obvious choice would be the elves from the Enshrined Wilds, uh, but you could choose one of the Dryad families, as they are by far the greatest warriors. There is also the Northern Selkies. They have the means to rally against Athia. Her voice trailed away as Pyra looked around. Her father was giving her that familiar look, the one that often told her to be quiet and remember her place. But as an idea almost slammed into her... She let out a soft chuckle. She returned her attention to the Ebrian king, a smile pulling at her face. But the smartest option would be to marry me. Pyra! Lodhir reached out for his daughter, pulling her away. Resisting her father, she remained steadfast and glowered at him. Why not? I have been schooled for just this sort of thing, and you are his closest ally. Our fate is now tied to his. As such, I have the greatest cause for ruling with Ebra's best interest in mind. Pyra folded her arms across her chest once more. Besides, he knows he'd be getting someone with more than just a pretty face. Elias chuckled at her candor. Lodhir pushed between the two, urging his daughter back and clapping a hand on the young king's shoulder once more. I assure you... This was not my intent when I brought my daughters with me today. He shot Pyra a dangerous look. In truth, we brought them to learn humility 
and to grieve the loss of the nation's queen. Wasted effort for some, it would seem. He couldn't wipe the smile from his face. Elias shook his head as he returned the sulky king's gesture. <laughs> Forget decorum. You should have brought her to all of our council meetings. If half the men in there had a fraction of the fire of this one, the entire continent would be under one flag by now. With a rush of embarrassment, Pyra felt her cheeks go red. The joy faded from Elias's face as he pulled away from Lothir to speak with his daughter. I am not entirely sure of what your father's lessons have taught you, but your role here would be a difficult one. Are you sure this is what you want? The obviousness of this option didn't sit well with him. It made him feel as if he were taking advantage of the situation, of her. But his other choices were too far away or would stagnate in delegation before he received word back. The process could take months just to find out his proposal had been declined. She was right. She was the smartest choice. Pyra couldn't recall the last time someone spoke to her like she was her own person and not just the daughter of the Selkie King. She scoured his face, searching those ice-blue eyes for anything that would tell her this was wrong, but she found nothing but honesty there. As she stood before the memorial of the last queen, mourners still trickling in with their gifts, she knew in her heart this was what she was meant to do. She steadied herself with a breath before she replied, Yes, in order to stop the Inquisition, new alliances must be forged. Courtship and the matter of relationships was one of the things his father had never gotten around to teaching him. Following his gut, Elias reached out and wrapped his fingers around her hand. While this war wages on, I will be away for months at a time. His gaze flickered to the tomb with a wince. I cannot guarantee a marriage filled with love, but you would always have my respect and admiration, and you will always be safe inside these walls. Is that still what you want? You cannot scare me out of this decision, King Elias. A smile curled Pyra's features as that flutter in her heart turned into a steady hammering as he plucked up a flower and offered it to her. He exhaled slowly, letting the calm wash over him. Elias brought her hand to his lips and gently kissed her knuckles. Then, yes, Pyra, daughter of Lord here, I will marry you. Varen was in the middle of removing the cloak Lucian had draped around him when cheers and clapping caught his attention. He turned and saw several mourners congratulating Elias, the Selkie King, and a young woman who appeared to be one of his many daughters. He was about to question the display, but stopped when his brother slid an arm around the young woman. Looks like Elias doesn't want peace after all. A frown tugged at Varen's brow as he struggled to cope with all that he was seeing. What does this mean? He needn't have asked the question, however. He knew. A new queen for the throne, and what was likely to be many heirs to carry on his legacy of death. He felt something disconnect and sour from within. You may keep the cloak, brother. Lucian slid his arm around his sibling, turning him back towards a small gathered crowd. When you said you could rule in Elias's place, I was gifted an idea. A smile curled his lips. I have some people you should meet. An Interlude of Intrigue, A Tale of Three Kings, is book 3.5 by Leslie Heron, a short novella to set the stage for the upcoming book four of the series. If you would like to listen to the first three books, please be sure to check the links in the description. 
and stay tuned every few weeks to hear the latest chapters as they are being written and recorded. We hope you enjoyed the story. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.